You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hi everyone, this is your host, Daniel Lee here. And I wanted to give you some background on the actual podcast. So I really like asking people what they do. And I've had jobs as a public accountant, a management consultant, and lately as a public equities investor. And in getting these roles, I had to speak to a lot of people who were already doing what I wanted to do. And it turned out that what the media and industry stereotypes say about the role is not at all accurate to what you actually do. And it was not, this was not to mention that most assumptions people set about uh, a certain individual's journey into that career field was also wrong. Um, this was because it's never as linear as people think it is. It's never as simple as you do A, then you go to B, and then you will get to do C. It's actually much more complicated that, than that, and that's what I realized after having spoken to over 80 different people to learn about what they did. And something I found out was that a lot of my friends had not learned this yet. Some eventually would because they have already started reaching out to people to actually learn about what they did but I also knew that many wouldn't because cold calling people really frightened them and that's completely understandable it still scares me too but I also am always extremely curious about what other people do and I love hearing about their stories so I figured maybe I can help them out with this podcast and just document what I would normally be talking about with other people. And so that's what this podcast is about. It's me finding people with career journeys that I find interesting and or they have roles that I would like to learn more about. And so I really do hope that I can add value to you in that sense as I go about selfishly using this podcast to learn more about other people and fulfill my own curiosity. So yeah, there you have it. So today's guest is Ricky Lai. Ricky is a senior associate at Portage Ventures. And Ricky made the start in his career in audit back in KPMG. And he is also a University of, of Waterloo alum. So that's where I kind of made the connection and connecting with him. But his career journey is fascinating in that after audit, he moves into a bit of deal advisory for private equity firms, and he goes into doing portfolio management for Peter Thiel's fund, and then goes into operations as a product guy for a fintech company, and then now he's a venture capitalist. And we go through just the thought process and the journey of what each change is like as well as how the role shifts what your daily activities change into and how actually kindness in on Ricky's part to help other people led to his current role at Portage Ventures and so this is this was a very heartwarming story for me and it also was very interesting to learn more about what actually goes on in the early stage venture capital investing world. And I do hope that you find value out of this conversation. Okay, hi everyone. And today we have Ricky Lai with us today. Ricky, thanks for joining us. Um, Ricky is a senior associate at Portage Ventures. And to start off with Ricky, for the audience's sake, can you describe what makes Portage unique in the venture capital world? Thank you for having me, Daniel. Um, 
I think Portage, um, I've, I've only been here for just over a year, uh, but what really intrigues me about Portage is uh, having a, a really strong view on how technology, uh, specifically fintech, uh, can help improve the, the financial health and, and, and wellness of the general Canadian public. Um, so in that sense, we target a lot of um, what we call B2C business to consumer applications mm -hmm. um, in, in the market today. Um, these new startups who are reaching out to the, the general retail consumer markets are facing tremendous challenges in in acquiring customers, especially on, on the marketing side. Um, you know, there's there often uh, is a need for um, a deep capital need f um, around the marketing costs mm -hmm. uh, for these companies. And given our LP's experience in, in this space, uh, particularly in wealth management and insurance, uh, we understand uh, what it takes to, to get up to scale. And one of, one of our, our, our dreams is to basically leverage that experience and then really help our entrepreneurs uh, succeed in reaching a large market. Um, and starting with Canada and, and hopefully one day become a global company for many of our portfolio companies. Mm, okay, and so then you guys are specifically focused on the fintech area, more or less? Yeah, so within fintech, we also have a couple key verticals that we're especially interested in. Mm. Uh, one of them is, is wealth management. Um, and within this space, um, one of the most kind of well-known name in the Canadian fintech space is well simple um, and and that's kind of one of our marquee uh, portfolio companies um, and obviously you know we continue to have very strong conviction um, in how well simple is changing the, the behavior of how people think about savings and investments in general mm. um, the second bucket is around digital banking and personal finance um, and specifically in Canada, we have an investment called Coho. Yes. Um, yeah. It's sort of the, the next generation of how we think about banking from a digital realm, mm -hmm. uh, really understanding what it needs to, to satisfy the modern day banking experience, not just about you know, building branches around the cities, branches around the country, but using something that we have and hold every day in hand uh, being our mobile phone um, and how do you use that device to create an experience that's seamless and um, that users feel are you know they're very much engaged with their financial um, status or, or health in general mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay no th thank you for the uh, description i think it sheds good light into understanding you know how the organization works as well as what you focus on. And so before we dive further into um, the company itself, I wanted to take back and maybe go look into your past a little more where um, when I look at your LinkedIn profile, for example, we, we have very similar commonalities where we both went to the University of Waterloo, we went to the accounting program there and started off both an audit at KPMG. Mm -hmm. And how does that... Like, can you take me back to the earlier stages where where does that lead into how you got here now where you started out in audit did you start off with an intention of breaking into a fintech space later on or um, what was the mindset like at that point I, I can be very honest in, in this regard is that early on in my career you know fintech probably at the time wasn't even a term yeah you know? yeah um, so, you know, there was zero intention of, of thinking about, oh, one day I'm going to be in fintech, specifically uh -huh. in, you know, the, in, the, in an investment management role. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just like you said, going back to the, the Waterloo uh, time period, um, I was in a program called accounting and, and mixed with biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Part of the reason for that was I've always had an interest in, in technology and, and, you know, that was a way for me to, to kind of blend the quantitative slash scientific 
side of of the world mm-hmm. with with the business side of the world mm-hmm. uh, being the accounting piece um, and you know within within that i've I've gone into a wide array of of courses like molecular bio, biotechnology you know evolution um, as as one of the courses as well uh, but alongside with that i've I've gotten a chance to to learn a bit about corporate finance business strategy um, and and you know, in investments as well. And I think that experience really prepped me well in terms of understanding that there is a lot more um, that, you know, that I want to be curious about. Mm. Um, and outside of just having a set of rules that I follow around accounting, um, you know, what is the implication or, or the application of, of um financial information um, to the greater world beyond just having, you know, when, when, when people sometimes think about the audit, um, it's, it's sort of, um, they're kind of like the policemen of financial information, if I, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, auditors serve an important role nonetheless, right, to, to make sure that, especially for public companies and, and all the and, and, and all the companies which have external stakeholders, how do we ensure that what they're reporting from time to time um, are correct or at least you know representative of of the company's financial health as a, as a whole? Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important. Um, but I think through um, my studies and whatnot, I've I've learned to become curious about not just how the company's doing but what it wants to do and and where where it will where it will go in the next kind of 5 10 20 years mm-hmm. um at least right and and that um curiosity i guess led me into a role within KPMG um after after spending some time in audit um i i switched over to a team that's called uh transaction services mm-hmm which mainly does uh, due diligence work for strategic and, and private equity investors. And in that, in that role, um, what I really got a chance to, to experience was really understanding the various types of business models that are out there, understanding the variety of, of industries that are in the market today, um, you know, not just in Canada, but more um, globally as well, um, the, the type of industries that are important in each country mm-hmm. um, and that serves as a really good kind of learning ground for um, for for the ability to to adapt my skill set um, to the investment world and I would say after transitioning you know so after spending some time in in the transaction services group um, spent about three years there I start to to realize that you know in I can I can really apply that skill set mm-hmm. um, in in a more traditional kind of buy side investment role. Right. And um, I came to the opportunity, um, fortunately, to to work with a company called um, Metro uh, Three Hundred and Sixty, mm-hmm. which is actually an affiliated uh, portfolio analytics and portfolio management arm of a venture capital fund uh, based in Silicon Valley called Mithro Capital. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, Mithro Capital is started by Peter Thiel uh, with his co-founder, Jay Royan. Um, and they invest in uh, growth state ventures um, in industry, ag- industry agnostic and um, are primarily focused on building long-term, long-lasting businesses um, in even some uh, niche markets. Mm-hmm. So with that experience, I've, I've learned a whole lot about um, venture as a, as a space right. um, and, and also um, understanding how to, how to you know, scale up companies and, and witness some of those companies going from, from round to round yeah. um, and, and how they've progressed from a business milestones perspective. Um, and I, that served as an important transition f- in, in, in my early careers, I would say, to, to really feel the need to um, 
spend more time in building companies and 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 having sort of a a sense of participation in in building up some something versus yeah. more just a value transfer um I, I really want to be part of a value creation process mm. and, and so if you don't mind me kind of interrupting you a little bit um the initial shift from audit into the deal side was that um what was that process like was it an intended thing where you, you felt that this was the next step to learn towards becoming um going to maybe the investment space or create learning to actually do the deal transfer um processes etc um, and it was was it a very smooth um time period when you transitioned over to kpmg and then contracting that with going from kpmg now from the deal side to mithril how did that thought process go where you was it the intent where you thought you know what, I, I want to en- enter this venture space it sounds interesting um and this is what i've been working up towards like, what were the two transitions like yeah so the the transition internally within kpmg was very easy mm. um you know kpmg is a, i would say a great place to start uh, anyone's career mm. um and i got i've gotten the chance to to meet one of the the partners in the transaction services group through an internal kind of job fair event oh. um that they 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 host for um th- their employees who spent a couple of years um in in audit mm-hmm. Um, and then that was really kind of eye-opening in terms of the, the number of s- different services that KPMG provides to the various businesses out there. And, um, you know, trans- transaction services as a group really caught my eyes um, on, with a few different factors. One is they're tremendously fast-paced, um, and, and that's something that, that I really enjoy is working in a, f- a fast-paced environment where... Um, you can quickly learn about an industry, dive into a business model, and understand what are some of the the nuances, and 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 ask some very detailed and specific questions um, during that process, all within like a two to four weeks time period, and and I think you know that that sort of time sensitive um, and 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 time sensitive process i would say um it really drives uh, a certain sense uh certain sense of adrenaline mm. um and and that's really something that i enjoy um but going back to the learning aspects um it's it certainly serves me i think well in the sense that in audit i'm more or less confined to a certain industry sector right. uh given how how big the the KPMG audit group groups are um generally the um what they do is they focus on a specific special uh, they focus on a specialization and so that as an employee of that group um you're focused on either let's say a mining client or industrial clients or a consumer market client um and what i really wanted to to do was to expand that array of of industries that i'm acquainted with and then from there really find uh an industry that that I would kind of come to love in 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 the future right mm-hmm. um and with transaction services actually um I started out as being more of an a generalist um you know doing a lot of different uh deals as as we call it um in a variety of industry Um, but later on in the process i've started to specialize more around software and and healthcare and you know i think that in particular led me to kind of where i am today um being in the venture space just thinking about the potential of you know software as a business and 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 how do you you know create that um you know create a process where where you're not just selling the same software for 20 years and and neglecting changes in in a in a fast-paced environment as as we know technology is evolving today um and and really using that to um and really using that to to create change in the world instead right um and contrasting 
that internal experience to uh, my transition to Metro, mm -hmm. um, as your question, that was very different. Um, my transition to, to Metro, um, KPMG, even though I call transaction services a, a, a smaller group in, in general than, than audit, right. we were still, at the time, uh, a, a 30, about 30 people in Toronto and, and 50 people nationwide. Um, transitioning to Metro, there were three employees in Toronto oh, wow. and, and a team of about 10 or 11 in, in San Francisco. Okay, wow, yeah. So the, the change was immediate. Yeah. Um, and it was good because I get to um, learn about the entire portfolio. Uh, it wasn't just here, Ricky, um, learn about two of our 15 portfolios. It, it was here, Ricky, learn about all 15 of these companies. And, you know, they, you will need to spend time on, on each of these companies um, in, down the road. Right. Right. So, so th that was, I think, um, an, an eye opener in terms of um, the, the learning curve that I have to to take, um, and and bear in mind that most of these fifteen companies are in different industries as well. So just learning about their competitors, learning about the industry dynamics, and even you know one of the one of the company was based in France. So to understand even just how employee you know, social contribution works for an employer in, in France was, was some, one of the nuances that I would have never had the chance to, to dive into. Um, but yeah, like f from a portfolio management role, um, I, I, I have a lot of chances to, to really uh, demonstrate the, the skill sets that I've developed over the years at KPMG. Um, around you know sound financial management uh, for the portfolio companies and and helping them uh, from that perspective, but also um, really helping um, the San Francisco team out in in various due diligence areas, uh, mainly on the financial and commercial side as well. Understanding you know for example how various contracts uh, down the road will will play out and and what are some of the the underlying risks involved in those contracts as well. Mm -hmm. And then continuing on um, before I interrupted you to the next stage where you said, okay, you're doing some portfolio management now and you started getting an inkling to wanting to actually create value within a company and you transitioned over to Money Key for that purpose. Um, but before you actually transitioned over, what, what, what were the inklings that made you yearn for the, the move to actually leave the more professional services world that you're very accustomed to and make the leap over? To to Mithra or to, to Money, Money Key? Key? I would say that the leap to to Money Key stems from just spending years kind of on the outside mm. as, as I was feeling like. Um, you can be an advisor to a transaction, um, but you would actually it's, it's almost like eating a hamburger without the patty. Um, you can be experiencing the deal as uh, an investor buy into a company. You can be an advisor and have that experience for the same client as they um, divest out of the company. But you have no idea what's in the middle in terms of value creation and, and how do you grow that business. And that's one thing that I felt um, I was missing um, from the KBMG experience. Um, and that really got validated uh, during my time at Metro was I can be doing portfolio management work for a venture capital firm, um, understanding where all the businesses are and, and advising them on, on steps to take in terms of um, you know, understanding where they've they've missed some of their, their plans and, and how do you kind of course correct that. Um, but really you're not there to, to be the execute, the, the executor mm -hmm. of, of those plans, right? Um, and I felt like that's the part that I was ultimately missing. Right. Um, so I really wanted to pursue an opportunity 
where I can be on the ground um, in in the midst of all, all you know all the chaos uh, of a startup and and really help create value uh, from from nothing mm-hmm. is actually um, and 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 that's when I decided the position at Money Key was was a good one for me to join because not only is you know so just to maybe step back a little bit and describe my position at Money Key, yeah. um, it was originally a, a, a very finance focused role, um, but ultimately you know I've I've because because a startup you know you, you always wear many hats uh, right. within within one, and ultimately. You know, I've touched uh, on the finance side. Obviously, you know the the typical kind of a bit of accounting and 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 whatnot. But also looking closely at product pricing strategy um, across the different products, um, across different states, and then understanding uh, also the, the the investor dynamics. Um, you know, behind behind the company. Um, understanding how we should be considering cost of capital um, into the into the company, um, and and how that plays out from a, from an overall financial profitability perspective uh, when we're considering our product pricing, mm. um, and and also you know leveraging you know that that experience and and helping uh, some of the, the the operational side as well, and at, you know that was. Super fun, I would say yeah. that that whole experience because, you know, a lot of time, a lot of times I I step into the company, and you know Monday through Wednesday you feel like oh by Wednesday I've accomplished everything that I've I've set out to do on the Monday, only to realize that you know two other fires have started somewhere else <laughs> by Wednesday <laughs> afternoon and 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 you spent kind of. Thursday through Friday, or even Thursday through Sunday, um, trying to figure out, you know, how how do you resolve that? Right. Um, and I I think that's an interesting experience, and that's an experience that I've I've never gone close to as someone sitting on the outside as an advisor or as an investor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also have a much greater sense of appreciation, um, you know, when when I was at KPMG. I would always be kind of the ones making up a list of due diligence requests and and asking someone to kind of fulfill that so that I can you know do my modeling do my analysis on on those data um, when I got to money key uh, I was very closely involved in a process where we raised uh, that capital okay nice and you know during that process I was sitting on the other side of the table where You've got all these investor requests coming in, um, <laughs> and understanding how to satisfy them, and at the same time, you know, really, um, not just providing them with with the raw data, right. but answering their actual questions and and helping them de-risk their investment to a level comfortable. I think I think that's the part where I can finally say that I've. I've blended both sides of the table and and understand where to create that channel in between uh, the two sides. Okay, and when you were initially making, you know, when you were, when you decided, okay, now I want to go out, be part of the operations, value creations of a company. What initial um, criteria drew you to Money Key? Was there something specific that you were looking for to um, in a company that you wanted to join? I wanted to be well because of my experience, uh, mostly focusing on private equity type um, companies um, at, during my time at KPMG, and then later on at Mithro, they were f- very focused on growth stage growth stage ventures, which were typically kind of Series D and B- and beyond, uh, oh. as we define it today. So it was. I didn't think I was ready to join, you know, a very early stage kind of, you know, three people out of the garage type of a company. Right, right. Um, and so I wanted that middle transaction, you know, a company that has the financial backing or, or you know, has achieved sort of profitability, but at the same time is is trying to get to a larger scale, 
Um, and that's where I feel like I've, I can add a lot of value uh, to, to that process and at the same time still have a lot of learning potential f- for myself um, out, of, out of that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Mon- Money Key was kind of in, in that stage of a company um, where, you know, obviously they've, with, with, with a good business, they've, they've stayed, you know, profitable. But at the same time, you know, there are so many uh, nuances and changes and regulations, and and obviously it's a very competitive market as well. Um, and and to navigate through all of that to to get to a larger scale requires a lot of time and attention as well. Mm-hmm. And now you've gotten your fingers wet in the operations, and then you decide to actually go back to the investing world. What what prompted that? Was it was the initial intent to just you know get your fingers wet, get some of that exposure to get a different perspective and eventually go back to the investing world or was there something else that made you actually miss it while you were at Money Key? It was actually completely out of the blue. Oh, really? um, so I initially uh, reached out to to Adam Faleski who's um, the CEO at Portage mm-hmm. uh, about a, a LinkedIn posting that that he he shared um, or, or that I saw one of one of his associates shared um, on, on LinkedIn about hiring for a CFO um, at one of the incubators called Diagram that Portage has invested in. Right. And given my background with KPMG and, and knowing a lot of, you know, having a strong finance network within Toronto and, and, and Montreal as well, um, I thought it would be, you know, uh, courteous to kind of reach out and ask Adam if there's anything that I can help or referrals that I, that I can make. Not sure kind of where they are in that process. Oh, okay. Um, and eventually that sparked into, that sparked a conversation about me joining Portage. Um, uh, and I've known Adam uh, through a, a previous uh, partner at, at, at KPMG. Well, I should say a partner at KPMG that I previously um, interacted a lot with. And you know that that led to conversations around you know my experience with with venture, um, and eventually got the chance to meet uh, a few more people on on the team, and um, and it just felt like a, a natural fit. You know, I obviously at that time um, I don't have a lot of experience in fintech specifically, right? Outside of Money Key um, being being you know, a, a, fin- a fintech company as well. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, you know, personal finance, as I've, as I've told, um, probably, as I've probably told you before, is, is always yeah. an interest of mine, um, especially on, on the, the budgeting side and the banking side, you know, I've, I've created, you know, very you know, rough tools um, out of Google Sheets and, and out of Excel's for, for my personal purposes. And, and I've always felt like you know, there must be better tools and better products out there that, that can help me solve a lot of these problems. So when the Portage opportunity came to me, you know, it, it, was, it was very attractive. Mm. Um, the, one, the one thing that I did consider was whether I've had uh, enough of an opportunity to be an operator right. um, and to really be in, inside a startup and, and helping create that value. Um, but ultimately, my, I guess how I kind of resolved that di- internal dilemma was the fact that Portage is really focused on early stage uh, fintech startups um, in, in Canada, in US, and also um, a large part of Western Europe as well. Mm. And the very fact that we invest into early stage companies means that they need a lot of help. Um, and you know, the, the opportunity for me to uh, help these companies out in, in various manners, you know, specifically around financial modeling or business strategy um, or even, you know, other ad hoc projects, you know, really resonated with me in, in kind of satisfying that, that urge to be an operator. <laughs> um, so it was, it was, I would say, you know, I've only been here for a year, but, you know, during the past year, it's, it's been quite a healthy balance of um, being an investor, understanding 
uh, what companies do, um, performing due diligence uh, on, on potential opportunities, but at the same time also spending a lot of time helping our portfolio companies grow, um, understanding how they're doing um, com compared to you know, when we when we initially invested and, and set up for them to do and and even introducing to them to the to the right partners um, who can be who can kind of lead them to the next investment round. Yeah. Right. A lot of those, you know, I I, I very much enjoy. I would say. And I, th I think I think it's really truly fascinating how you, this whole opportunity that fits with what you want to do came up just because you reached out to help someone you already knew. Is that something you always done previously and um, it was just like a very natural thing for you to reach out to someone on LinkedIn and say, oh yeah, hey, let me help you out with my network in any shape or form. Is that something you've always done? Yeah, I would say particularly on on kind of the finance professional side. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've in, my, in my past experience, you know, seen seen a lot of those posting and and you know I've I've always known a, a wide network of, of professionals who are looking at kind of the next step in their career mm. as well, and you know not saying that I have a kind of a professional matchmaking <laughs> business here, but um, I've I've always enjoyed making the connections and making the introductions for you know great people who who might, who might be looking for a great role, mm. um, and and that. You know, something I would say that's that's natural that I've been doing for for a long time now. Oh, that's amazing! Uh, I think, um, in in a way, all the nice things that you've done, you volunteered your time to do, has eventually paid off into this kind of opportunity coming to you. Um, and so, if kind of continuing on the um, what you described about what you do in Portage and how now you're getting a bit of that operational mix as well as investing, so you get to. You know, have your cake and eat it as well. Mm -hmm. um, is that would you say what you are doing now is quite normal for others who are in the early stage venture world as well, or is it something more unique to what you guys have decided to do? Because I know when I've had conversation with some venture capital individuals that they would actually prefer to invest in companies that don't need a lot of operational help, for example, and they choose to do that. Um, how does that, uh, yeah, compare and contrast with? That? What you've seen, I would say, in general, there are a few different models that that venture capital firms out there um, are are kind of following. Mm -hmm. um, one is really just um, investing their capital in in a wide array of of companies, um, and and really leveraging you know probability. Um, to to um, gain a return, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, betting on let's say you know three out of ten companies that they invest in to to become winners and and perhaps kind of return the fund plus plus a little bit more for their LPs. Um, and and you know, you would oftentimes see um, in in that in that specific model. Um, Investors who write a lot of small, smaller size checks, um, and and hopefully you know gain a, a large enough a large enough portfolio, you know in terms of logos, um, or well in terms of companies who can who can then you know be, at least you know a few of them will will become um, that kind of unicorn or big companies down the road. Um, the way that Portage and and certainly a few others in in the industry today as well um, operate is that we believe that you know Portage can be more than just a capital provider. Mm. Um, we re we very much want to want to be you know the 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 right partner for these startups. And what I mean by that is we'll deploy our resources. Um, people who have had the experience of building something at scale, or people who have done who have scaled something from you know from from zero to twenty, from twenty to hundred, um, and and that can be in a variety of of 
functions. Uh, we have uh, people on our team who are sales experts, um, who are HR experts, mm. um, who are very good at engaging the wider kind of startup or community, um, in whether in Toronto or in Canada or in you know in, in very specific places. Um, obviously, we also have very tech focused um, and zero entrepreneurs even in in, in the past. Who, who have joined our team and, and decided that they want to leverage their individual experience to help um, perhaps you know sit with our, our portfolio companies once every two weeks or once a month um, and really guide them through you know the, the stages that they're at and, and give them the right advice uh, which they um, would have hoped to get at the time when, when they were starting up their businesses. Mm. I think I think, you know, from from that perspective, it, it it not only provides the help that our our entrepreneurs you know would would need at at the early stage when they might not have as many resources either from a capital perspective or from a talent perspective to to run things more smoothly, but at the same time, it's it's a way for us to also uh, provide a an advantage for our companies to grow and, and have, and certainly to try to reach that escape velocity um, against wherever the, their competition may come from. Mm. And if, if I'm not mistaken, um, Portage is, um, it's still a smaller organization than, for example, like what Money Key has grown to be um, when you've left it. And going back to a, more, a smaller organization again, um, I guess, from my experience, when I moved over to the buy side, I joined a $45 billion fund. So mm-hmm. it was, there wasn't much risk weighing in my head in terms of, oh, would they go out of business? No, probably not. I don't think $45 billion just goes out on its own. So it's very stable. I think for most people joining a public equity fund, it, we don't think too hard about something blowing up. Mm-hmm. But for venture capital funds, um, they're relatively much smaller in scale. I think something that's considered large would be like Andreessen Horowitz, which has like, I think, what, eight billion, seven billion nowadays. Um, so for you, like, was that risk ever existent in your mind when you were leaving Money Key and choosing to join a smaller early stage venture capital firm? To be honest, I've actually haven't thought a lot about the, the risk side of things when, oh, yeah. when I joined um, Portage. Um, Simply because, like, I'm not, you know, five years away from retirement or anything like that. I right. think I think I'm at a at a point in my career where um, I can be, I can have a larger at- risk appetite, um, and to really try things that um, that I enjoy, um, go into an industry where I think I can I can add value, mm-hmm. um, and th- and that's really kind of the angle that I was coming in from. Um, and you know, I think we're also very fortunate at, at Portage Ventures that um, we have the backing of one of the largest financial services group in, in Canada, being Power Financial, um, and and within that that group, you know, Paul Demery the third particularly is is kind of spearheading Portage and and our initiative as well, um, and you know, with with. Him and, and Adam Fileski as, as kind of the leadership group of, of our firm, um, I, you know, I have a lot of faith and, and confidence in, in us kind of carrying out the vision that 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 we have and and also you know leveraging um, their experience to 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 scale and 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 you know perhaps provide uh, or find find capital for for us to to carry out the vision. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. And diving a little more now into your kind of day to day in your role. Um, last time when we grabbed coffee, you mentioned how it, when I asked you to break down your um, activities into buckets, you said fifty percent of your day is in meetings, and around thirty percent is doing due diligence, with twenty percent being about portfolio management. Would you say that's still relatively accurate, or has the answer changed since? Yeah, I would. I would say that's still fairly accurate. Um, you know, as being on the investment team at such a young fund, um, 
obviously we'll have to spend a lot of time uh, finding the right deals to to invest in, um, seeking the right entrepreneurs that we can partner with, mm-hmm. and then build a great ecosystem um, of within our portfolio. Um, so a large portion of my time is is spent on talking to various different entrepreneurs, understanding their business ideas, and and constantly you know be in that mindset of thinking about how how their business can change the world, how their businesses can interrupt or disrupt um, the incumbents that are in the market, and and how will that look, you know, five ten years from now? Um, are there possibilities that they can partner up with uh, one of the bigger corporates or or Mm -hmm. is it a company that's basically set a path to become big on its own you know there are certainly various different ways to for a company to scale and i love the idea of exploring those paths with different entrepreneurs as well Mm -hmm. um yeah and, and obviously being on the investment side uh, we we have to be diligent in, in who we invest in. So a, 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 lot, a certain portion of my time uh, on a day-to-day basis is, is spent on looking more deeply at the, the investment itself. Um, not only are we looking at who, who we're inv- investing in, you know, being the founders, um, and, and whether the product as it's built to date has any kind of major concerns around them, um, but we also spend a lot of time doing market research, uh, industry research around, um, you know, various portions of the value chains within the industry, and and how you know this one idea is is, is capturing uh, certain economic benefits within within the value chain as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think one thing that's different for me in terms of due diligence compared to my days at KPMG mm-hmm. uh, is, you know, we certainly um, still need a sense of you know the financial model and and projections of of where we think the company is going to go, but more importantly, we need to uh, recognize at a very early stage what the market potential and the the overall um, and so called kind of outcome twenty years ten ten twenty years down the road will be for a company um, that's just starting out today. Mm-hmm. And go, um, talking more about that contrast of the private equity due diligence you had where those companies relatively are, they're not really early stage anymore. They've been profitable for years, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And now you're looking at early stage companies. Um, if I even think about the analysis I used to do in my due diligence in public companies, we have so much information that uh, there's a lot of things to choose from. It's more deciding what do we not look at. Yeah. For you, if you had to contrast even the private equity days to now, how can you give me an example of how the due diligence was different where... I would imagine the KPMG ones could, would have way more information and way more detail that you can be more comfortable with. Compared yes, to now. certainly, and and I think you know we have to first understand that the the risk profile of a private equity investment and and a venture investment is is very different, mm-hmm. right? And to me, the the due diligence process is always about you know not finding the right answers to all the questions you have, mm-hmm. but it's to the risk the opportunity to a point where um, you know you as the as the investor or as the firm can accept that level of risk um, and and obviously you know associate that with a certain level of return as well um, so you know say, saying that you know we certainly have a lot more information uh, when when I used to do um, any kind of due diligence with KPMG and, and their clients. Oh, really? um, but I think what I do more now at, at Portage is about finding different sources of information and triangulating that into into a thesis um, that that is sound and, and reasonable and, and can be shared with, with everyone and certainly all the partners around the table. Mm. And when you're actually speaking and sourcing these various um, investment opportunities do you tend to focus more on the entrepreneur uh, and kind of bet on the actual jockey that's driving the horse or do you like how do you weigh the um, investment thesis more on like whether you really love this entrepreneur and you think even if this company right now doesn't go well I think he can pivot 
it to something completely different or do you weigh more on the actual business itself? Mm. How does that balance work? I think it's different for every single investment that we've made. Yeah. But what we certainly strive to do as a firm is is to get the the best of both. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need obviously you need a great product or a great idea and a great vision um, to to make for a successful business. But mm-hmm. we we recognize that at the early stage, you know, if it weren't for the founders, there would be no business, right? These people, you know, the founders. And the entrepreneurs out there are tremendously brave risk takers, and to find the right people who can execute, who can scale a business, and and who can carry out a vision, um, is is basically half of our equation. Hmm. Um, and we certainly value uh, entrepreneurs in in the way not as purely a management team on. On one of our portfolio companies, uh, we value them as more our partners in in carrying out that strategy to to bring a product to market or to to scale up a business, you know, because um, we can only provide so much capital and so much um, you know other resources that I've mentioned, um, but ultimately the the company itself and the vision behind it belongs to the founders. Um, and and they will be they will always be the ones who have who have the most drive and who spent the most effort in making that business a successful one. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for us to make any investments and and that, and I can say that for every single one of our portfolio companies right now um, is that we we truly believe in in the founders um, and and also you know their ability to execute and and carry out. The plan to to, to to deliver a great product to market. Mm. And um, I remember last time we spoke, you gave me this excellent uh, breakdown of how you source companies when you start with, let's say, a world of around two thousand companies, and you eventually whittle all that down through phone calls and meetings, all the way down to fifty. Um, it, is there an example of like a company that sticks out in your mind as when you spoke to them first? You just, it just hit you as like, wow, this this team is amazing, and if so, what characteristic kind of really stuck out to you when you first spoke with like, the founding team? That this one requires a bit more thinking in, yeah. in terms of you know just just recalling some of my experience mm-hmm. um, meeting meeting the founders first. Um, I would say even within within our portfolio, um, not necessarily in the in the investment uh, decision itself, but every time I meet uh, Daniel from Coho, you know he he's the type of um, he's the type of personnel that that strikes me as not afraid of change mm-hmm. and and not afraid of. Beating, beating norm, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a normal pe- a normal person doesn't just wake up one day and think like, I'm gonna take out. You know, I'm gonna disrupt the the banking world, you know, in in Canada, and you know, for him to have the vision and and the the early stage execution that have been you know very successful to date. Um, to to begin it to begin that journey, I think is is tremendous, and you know, aside, you know, along with that, you know, we we invest in in founders who, you know, despite of the the success that they've they've received so far, have been have stayed humble mm. and open to um, you know advice and suggestions, and you know that that can be really important. Um, you know, in the early days when um, when there's not much, you know, you not you might not be as founder uh, be familiar with either the regulations around things or you know the right contacts in 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 the industry to to talk to, um, and you know Daniel has been a great partner for us um, from from day one in terms of 
um, knowing you know knowing that we can he can leverage us on on the various contacts that we can provide um, and and also understanding um, the value that we bring to the table um, and then combining that with his own vision and and his drive to to really create a new banking experience um, or a new personal finance experience uh, for the market, mm-hmm. I think I think you know he he strikes me as as one of the kind of the brave pioneers um, in in Canada for within our portfolio. Mm. Oh, I think that's a solid example. Thank you. Um, and I I have a lot more questions I wanted to ask you, but I think. Uh, it, We've kind of slowly run out of time, and so I, I want to kind of finish off with uh, two quick questions. Where, if you could think back to the twenty-year-old Ricky back in Waterloo, mm-hmm. um, I guess you're in close to third year, and if he could look at where you are now, and what do you think his uh, emotional reaction would be? If if I was the twenty-year-old right now, so lo- if looking you, at the looking at the the me now yeah yeah what do you think the reaction would, be? would it be surprise disbelief or kind of more expectation that oh yeah that's exactly where i would have pictured myself to be i wouldn't say i would be surprised but at the same time definitely not oh yeah that's where i'm gonna be mm. um yeah like i've i've always imagined you know staying in kind of the the business and and business side of things um you know obviously given you know my educational background as well um but would have never imagined you know working specifically in fintech for sure right and um it's been you know i would say a very fortunate experience um that i've had early in the careers having you know different mentors through kpmg and people who connected me um to others um, so that I can learn more and and you know have have a wider wider network overall. I think you know there are a lot of people that I I need to thank you know mm-hmm. early early in my career, as well as you know even now and and I you know I I wish you know if there's one thing that that twenty year old Ricky would would have liked is um, to get to know those people sooner. <laughs> <laughs> so given given that uh what kind of advice would you give him would it be to just network more but at a younger age or i personally i don't like the the word network mm. um because it's been so overused in terms of you know network being creating new opportunities for yourself mm. or for your company um i would always encourage people to to stay curious and, and explore and discover. Um, and as long as you stay curious, you will find the drive to go and and meet new people and, and really ask them the questions that, that you want to know, not just kind of go and, and talk to people for the sake of, of, of making a connection and, mm. and getting a business card in that sense. Yeah. Um, and you know, if if you're always curious, you know any people you meet, you can carry on a conversation um, to understand their background, to understand what they're doing, to understand what they want to do down the road. I think, you know, that's one advice that I would I would give to to kind of the younger generation or even you know students now is um, stay curious, um, and that will drive uh, everything that you do down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, excellent. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Ricky. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, great. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcasts. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way. And included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the 
related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.